Oh, you can do your intro. Or watch your mouth. Yes. Yeah. Okay. If you don't hear anything from me, I'll watch your mouth. Right. Oh, So, Max, presumably you've been advised oh. to stay between the podium and the screen here pretty well covered. Uh, the other day we had John. Um, oh, yes. Yes, mine's similar. But it'll oh, pontificate if it's speculating. It does to get colder. Speculating but yeah. from the side like this, and it wasn't always on the screen all the time. So please feel free to you know, be oh. casual, but put on this side. Okay. okay. <laughs> I also, you know, the title is now been changed three times. That's fine. My apologies. That's cool. yeah, it's cool. it's the title is used again. No, absolutely. Okay. It's fine.
Well, welcome everybody. This is the uh, second in our uh, winter series of uh, public presentations. I see a number of new faces, so uh, I'm glad you found the, uh, the Terrace campus of, of UNBC. Um, if you haven't already seen our lineup, there's a, there's a few handouts at the uh, side here if you want to see which other lectures are uh, coming up in the uh, course of the, of the winter months here. And you can also be put on our notification list by email if you want to speak to Lana or Alma on your way out at the front desk there. My name is Phil Burton. I'm the uh, chair of the Northwest Region for UNBC. Uh, welcome to our, our campus. And uh, we're pleased to have today uh, Mr. Max Ritz, who is a doctoral candidate at the University of British Columbia in the geography program there. Um, we're, we're also pleased that these lectures are being picked up by CBC Radio. Some of you may have heard the, uh, the interview this morning on the radio. And uh, it's, uh, it's nice to see the, the exposure and, the, and the, uh, the, the focus on a number of our Northwest issues and, and topics here. So, um, I also wanted to just sort of bring up a, a topic that has emerged from time to time. Um, we've been accused sometimes of maybe having too many conservation-oriented topics here. And, you know, Max's discussion on the radio this morning, you know, talked about the implications of, of this to industrial development and so forth. And I just wanted to re-emphasize the fact that, you know, the university, this room is a forum for open and respectful discussion on all topics. So I'm giving you a heads up that we're going to have some industrial perspectives here, uh, probably in the fall as well. It's not necessarily, a, you know, all with a, an agenda of, of conservation. So, so we'll, we'll, we'll be diversifying the, the program considerably. Now, Max's topic today actually is a very good one at doing exactly what we like to see at a, uh, a small university campus, and that is blending some of the science and humanities, the social sciences and the arts, into one particular topic. And Max's background itself actually uh, reflects that. Uh, he, he's originally from Toronto, but he uh, uh, did some undergraduate studies in Russian literature at McGill. He then pursued uh, additional uh, studies in, in geography at Toronto, and has been working on his, his PhD at, at UBC since 2010. So he's going to talk about um, whale communications and some of its uh, implications to, to humans and our, and our lives as well. Take it away, Max. Thank you. I'd just like to thank UNBC Terrace and Bill and Alma and um, Maureen and other people who have been really supportive and helping me. Uh, encouraged me to do this talk and also to Marty Bowles who uh, gave me a ride this morning in Prince Rupert. So, thank you. And if I go too fast, please raise your hand. Don't worry about embarrassing me. Just I want to make sure I get the information across and I have a tendency to sometimes race. So I'll try my best here. Um, and I have a lot to say and a lot to hear too. I'm looking forward to the discussion. So let's begin with this photo I took of uh, Claire Turner. Claire was a 2012 intern at Cetacea Lab an independent whale research station on the north coast of BC. In this photo, Claire is engaging in a practice called passive acoustic monitoring. This is a scientific practice which is Cetacea Lab's primary portal into the activities of whales in the area. PAM involves listening for whales and gathering data about species type, abundance, and location. As this photo helps to convey, humpback and killer whales may be present, but largely invisible. They can surface for less than 10% of the time. And when they do surface, only about 10% of their bodies is seen, if that. Headphones on, Claire is listening to the hum of a hydrophone network floating in the recesses of Kamano Sound on the north coast. Hydrophones, or underwater microphones, are the portal we have to the communities of uh, whales underwater, and they are a key set of the data collection. My talk today is about what happens in a few moments from the time that I took this picture, when Claire suddenly hears a sound she will identify as a humpback whale song. The waters of Cetacea Lab one of the most spectacular regions in the world, are critical habitat to an incredible abundance of not only humpback, but also fin whales, killer whales, Pacific white-sided dolphins, harbor porpoises, and not far off from this area, gray whales, and even right whales too. Right whales were recently spotted, actually, near Haida Gwaii for the first time in over 60 years. So here's the hydrophone network I'm speaking of. Cetacea Lab is at the bottom of Gill Island, and you can see by the uh, red dots that they have quite a considerable spatial extent here. They can cover uh, 17 miles to the south, about 15 miles to the north, as far up as Harvey Bay, and then over towards Campania, and uh, further down south toward Aristotle Island as well. 
The Comeno Sound region has become a global flashpoint for beca because of the proposed Enbridge Northern Gateway pipeline. Enbridge would send over 200 oil tankers every year past Gill Island. A spill of any magnitude would be catastrophic for the region, simply put. For Cetacea Lab interns like Claire, therefore, doing whale science became inextricably linked with efforts to protect the region from mass industrialization. Listening to whales, establishing abundant statistics, migratory routes, behavior, became about protecting whales, as well as sea lions, fish, and wolves, and other residents of the North Coast. But my talk today isn't about Enbridge or even Cetacea Lab, but the history that brings us here, which is to say the history of listening to whales. A mixture of science, advocacy, and DIY living, Cetacea Lab belongs to the complex meeting of, of cetology, or whale science, and the environmental movement we see, an encounter which actually stretches as far back as the mid-1960s. The lab outlines ways of listening that over this period have involved and gathered an incredible array of cultural forces, from naval bioacoustics to new age cultures, from sit-ins to whale captures, from scientists to psychedelic rock musicians. And as you heard the interview this morning, yes, there will be a Pink Floyd moment in this talk. <laughs> Today, I want to suggest that we can learn a lot about this history by considering listening as a social practice. Listening to whales is not simply about nature. Profoundly, it is about culture as well and connections that affirm the deep and diverse ways that humans have constructed meanings and understandings of other lives, in this case, whales. Listening can tell us a lot about the forms of exploitation and injury that humans have brought upon whales as well. Listening to whales is not innocent, therefore. But at the same time, and as places like Cetacea Lab suggest, listening can be profoundly hopeful, ethical, and important politically. It can involve attachments to whales that are scientifically meaningful, especially today on the North Coast. In this talk, I focus on how these dynamics have evolved through cytology. So I focus on the science, and the science that has expanded with particular force here in BC, owing, I think, to a lot of factors, but specifically to the fact that there is an incredible array of whales in this area. In the North Coast, however, there are many whale stories. I do not consider the rich and varied oral traditions of Shimshan, Haida, and Nishka peoples. These are stories which also reveal lasting and complex bonds between humans and whales in the North Coast. They are stories that need to be told and can be by people who are much more knowledgeable than I am. In what follows, I focus on Western science, therefore. I map out five features of whale sound that have formed around cytology over the last 40 to 50 years. By, by relaying what I am calling the history inside whale sound, I hope to give you a better idea about the unique insights, responses, and relationships that have been formed with whales and through whales through sound. At the same time, though, I want to leave you with another means of understanding the importance on their protection, of their protection on the coast today. But before I get into those five features, I want to say a bit more about cytology, which is the focus, really, of this activity passive acoustic monitoring. In 1966, the pioneering cytologists Lawrence Schiebel and William A. Watkins wrote, We are pretty well restricted to acoustics for underwater measurements and observations at any distance greater than a few meters. For of our available sensory paths, only sound passes well through water. And this would be a key structuring principle for cytology, because as I said before, it's really hard to spot whales. They move around a lot, but not often above the water, and of course humans have difficulty doing much underwater. In 2012, I spoke with Andrew Trace, the director of marine mammalogy at UBC, and he gave me this statement. It comes down to what you can measure and record. Acoustics is probably the simplest and most consistent thing that can be done. There's actually an incredible history of references to whale sound. You can go back as far as Aristotle's Historia Animalum, 350 BCE. You can go to Edmund Spencer's The Fairy Queen in 1596. There's all sorts of references and shipping logs to the sounds that people heard. But in terms of scientifically perceived sound, whale sound really only emerged categorically in the 1940s through the offshore efforts of US submarine navigators. And I'm going to get into that in a second. So in terms of Western science, we've only really been listening to whales since around the time of Sheetle and Watkins. Now, 46, laters, 46 years later, Cytologists still listen to hydrophones. They still wonder at the mysteries of humpback whale sound, or the relationship between acoustically similar killer whale pods. But at the same time, we have many insights through listening, as well as those questions. Passive acoustic monitoring has been crucial for many advances in the field. Listening has come to form the basis for new distinctions of subspecies aptitudes, risks, and behaviors. The consensus that some whales, humpback whales, sing, while others echolocate, like killer whales. That killer whales hold different acoustic badges belaying family lineage in geographically specific areas of habitation. That individual species are differently affected by anthropogenic noise, or underwater shipping noise. In cytology, there is therefore a general agreement that hearing is a whale's primary sense. That depending on the species, sonic production can support activities ranging from orientation to communication to prey acquisition. In short, 
whales see through sound. They are profoundly oriented by the acoustic possibilities of their space. It's important to recognize, again, that many of these advances took place here in BC, down the coast, and all the way down the coast further to Washington and Oregon as well. BC is really an ideal setting for whales, however, and for the study of them. The area enjoys high populations of numerous species, and they're accessible within a coastal network of fjords or relatively quiet offshore spaces. Globally, whales were until the late 1960s largely forgotten sources of value. In, one, in the words of one historian, industrial commodities of dwindling importance. In BC, killer whales were generally regarded as something to avoid, a nuisance to thriving gillnet salmon industry fishermen in the 1950s. But since the 1970s, the province has become actively involved in establishing conditions for their revalorization, developing a protectionist regulatory system, supporting whale watching and related ecotourisms, and constructing the killer whale as the icon of BC citizenship. And I want to get into some of that history as well, because that really brings us to this question of economy again, and the ways that whales have really become entangled with what it means to be on the coast today. BC's southern resident killer whales are one of the most scrutinized animal populations anywhere in a prime focus of this talk. And they became socially celebrated at roughly the same time that they became fundamental to cetology. So one of the reasons I can really talk about the science and focus on some of the broader social implications is because of the unique nature of cetology in BC. It's a uniquely social phenomenon here. We see this with the different kinds of people who participated in the whale science over the years. There was a shifting <coughs> fault line between public and scientific understandings of whales on the coast. One of the reasons that listening became so popular is, again, because of the way that it evolved for the science and the way that the science brought in other interests. This has been noted by other scholars as well, but little focus has actually been given to the way that listening and sound has become a mediator for this public scientific interface. The fusions of citizenship, concern, desire, and spectacle that cetology would develop through whale sound in BC outline a social phenomenon that also emerges in broad strokes across North America, England, and in parts of Europe and Australia as well. So now we can get into the first of my five outlines. This is what I'm calling the voice as code. We have to begin earlier than the 1970s though, and elsewhere than BC. Whale sound began its social life as underwater noise. The false positives that were detected when submarine navigation tests in the 1940s and 50s attempted to find underwater communicative signal networks, the SOSIS channel, the SOFAR channel. These were layers of underwater um, strata that were capable of commu communicating uh, electronic signals across vast spaces. And as the submarine navigators began to use these spaces to explore communication, they got these interruptions. They heard things on the hydrophone they weren't expecting. These were the pings of uh, killer whales or the other kinds of sounds of the shrimp and castracea. Um, this, is, I, this would eventually resolve in something I'm calling the voice's code. And key to all of that is the hydrophone. Hydrophones are, of course, the portal that they use at Cetace Lab and that have stretched as far back as the 1940s and even earlier really into the 1910s when it comes to the first researchers that were going into the production of these things. Now, unaided human ears perceive underwater sound omniphonically from all directions at once. Military hydrophones could transduce underwater vibrations into a medium of optimal human audibility namely air, and also give it a sense of directionality. So you knew a sound was coming from one specific hydrophone or another specific hydrophone, as opposed to a whole kind of enveloping field of sound. Listening through hydrophones, submarine listeners came across strange hydrophonic outlays, those clicks that I was talking about just now. Clacks, croaks, grunts, rattles or thumps, according to one report. Whistles, squeals, chirps, clicks and rasps, according to another. The sounds began to intrigue naval researchers. Now, human hearing range falls between what's generally understood as 20 hertz to about 20 kilohertz, or 20,000 hertz. The upper range attenuating over time as we begin to lose our upper hearing ability. Killer whales produce sounds in the frequency of 4 kilohertz to 18 kilohertz, and humpback whales uh, 100, kilo, 100 hertz to 4 kilohertz. So these are animals that we can hear when we have the hydrophones. Other animals, however, other whales, such as fin whales, communicate at levels that are below our hearing range. And one of the arguments I want to make today is that one of the reasons that humpback whales and killer whales would have particular social relevance for people is because they could hear them. We couldn't hear blue whales or gray whales in quite the same way we could begin to hear the killer whales and the humpback whales. This is one of the first recordings we have that's been publicly disseminated. Remington Kellogg was a uh, whale researcher who originally started off as a military researcher. In 1951, the um, Army actually, in collaboration with Smithsonian Folkways, released this album, which uh, is basically just a bunch of animal recordings that no one had any idea about. No one knew what they meant. They were just interesting to people, and they thought, let's, let's have these albums come out and you know, see what kinds of responses we get. 
And what, what began to happen is people began to pick up on ideas that they were developing elsewhere outside of the military context. <coughs> the US Navy uh, Office of Naval Research, in turn, began to employ new researchers to study these signals. Um, so neuroscientists, sound engineers, and entrepreneurs began enrolled in the project of deciphering whale sounds. In the mid-1950s, one person, an oceanarium scientist named Arthur McBride, raised the hypothesis that maybe the dolphin squeals that they heard on records like this were a form of echo ranging, tantamount to sonar, or sound navigation and ranging. This is exactly the kind of information that submarine officers were curious about. And it initiated a slew of research projects around the use of cetaceans, whales, dolphins, porpoises, as proto-submarines, detectors that could acoustically <coughs> render the underwater landscape to track enemy submarine and monopolize new territory. So here's an example of one of those. This is Project Deep Ops, which used killer whales for dive and retrieve experiments. They would blindfold the killer whales, and they would get them to identify objects at the bottom of the ocean and retrieve them and bring them up. Ultimately, the collaborations brought Cold War military science into these new conversation, conversations with marine mammalogy, or later on, cytology. And this began to happen specifically in BC as well. Scholars generally agree that by the capture of Moby Doll, an important turning point had been reached for scientific and public appraisals of whales in BC. Moby Doll, killer whale, is what brought the naval bioacoustics interests into BC's scientific community. In 1964, a US cytologist named Ken Norris published a groundbreaking study on echolocation, having five years earlier trained a blindfolded dolphin named Zippy to locate underwater items <coughs> in a marine pen. Norris's findings were corroborated when Woods Hole scientists, Lawrence Schiebel and William A. Watkins, i.e. the people I brought up in the beginning of this talk, arrived at the Vancouver Aquarium in July of 1964 to record whale sounds, and specifically the sounds that Moby Doll was making. Their approach was an early iteration of PAN, passive acoustic monitoring. They were listening to Moby Doll through a barium titanate hydrophone and observing clicks in rapid fire succession, what they called click trains of a frequency band that was audible to human hearing. They also observed screams, which they had hypothesized to be communicational. So you had two related ideas happening. You had the clicks and you had the screams. And they began to sort of separate these and parse them apart to figure out what they could mean, what they could do, and ultimately how they could become useful for related efforts as well. And again, this research wasn't happening in social isolation. Local media intrigue had been sparked by the acoustic linkages that were being drawn from Moby Doll, not to mention the sheer presence of a captive whale. This is the first captive killer whale recorded anywhere, successfully, I should say, because there was an attempt before, but it wasn't successful. Scientists hope that the bleeping voice of Vancouver's captured female killer whale might entice a brave or a Morris young bull, wrote Davis McDonald of the Vancouver Sun. If Moby Doll's sonic output foregrounded a developing social utility, as the forays in music will reveal shortly, this is also because of the whale's growing familiarization. To a middle class readership, William Sheevel's, uh, Lawrence Sheevel's comment to the Newsweek magazine that the males are the gabby ones and the females are usually quiet, doubtless made some sort of sense. Interestingly enough, Moby Doll's gendering was later contradicted. Moby Doll later became realized as a Moby Dick. <laughs> <laughs> but killer whale's feminine harmlessness would, per would persist figuratively thanks to the domestication of what was once called a barbaric sea wolf. In other words, people began to feel comfortable around the idea of a whale being in a pen, being around kids, and so forth. Previous to that, you had this idea that whales were actual man-eaters, and there has never been a documented case of that in the history of wild whale encounters, mm -hmm. but that was the prevailing idea in the 1950s and 60s. And in large part, the transition happened because of Moby Doll. Whales in BC were increasingly seen as playful and gentle, rather than fierce and dangerous. And this actual um, social upsurge wouldn't happen for a few years, but this is the important forebear moment. When Moby's captors had allowed one day for public visitation, nearly 20,000 spectators appeared at the Vancouver area dry dock. Training, sound, training military subjects to listen for sound-guided objects, the early military efforts coded whale encounters as questions of functionality. That's the key point I want to leave you with, with this first point, for the voice's code. Researchers began to ask questions like, what are particular sounds for? What do whales do with them? It was no longer a case that they were simply noise. They were information then. As passive acoustic monitoring practices were taken up by wider social communities in BC, beginning in the late 1960s, these interests became more diffracted. And it is uh, to one of those now that I turn when I speak about the voice as music, number two. Frederick Kittler, a German philosopher, has a great summary of the entertainment industry, which he calls an abusive army equipment, speaking <laughs> about the ways that military technologies 
in the history keep getting reappropriated into all sorts of entertainment forms. We can think of the vocoder, we can think of turntables, and we can think of microphones as just a few examples. And in the 1970s, on the top of Vancouver Island, we begin to see people using hydrophones in that way as well. Mostly men in their 20s, they included students, filmmakers, activists, and the odd scientists. Recordings of killer whales off the coast of BC had been made earlier in the decade, but they were almost entirely the work of the Canadian and US navies. Now, in addition to listening through hydrophones bore from UBC or the now defunct Department of National Defense, civilian personnel were playing sounds back. They were playing sounds to the whales. In August of 1970, Paul Spong floated a soundstage into the killer whale rich waters of the Johnson Strait, bearing fireweed, a rock band intent on playing to the whales live. <laughs> when they weren't intercepting Russian or Japanese whalers, Greenpeace warriors, like this one over here, were serenading gray and killer whales in the open seas. One prominent figure in the scene, and someone I've had the pleasure of speaking to, was Eric Hoyt, an audio engineer who began attempting killer whale communication in 1973. Here's Hoyt describing his process. The voices music names this growing fascination that grew around the sonorous qualities of whale sound beginning in the 1970s. Music represented a two-fold change from earlier appraisals of whale sound. From noise, it represented organization. From code, it represented aestheticization. Whale music became a means to connect growing social interests in whales to broad social practices of listening and making music, listening to and making music. And in this regard, the signal event of the decade was surely the songs of the humpback whale, an album of humpback whale recordings released by cytologists Roger Payne and Scott McVeigh in 1970. The song's LP was actually preceded by a flexitous copy of the album sent to every National Geographic sus subscriber in 1969. And I want to play you a, a sample of that right now. The album later on would win a uh, Grammy in 1970 and has remained the best selling nature recording of all time. fascinating things about it is we all of a sudden have an album released by a couple of scientists that goes on to win a Grammy for the best album of the year. So how did this happen? And in fact, the story is connected to the naval bioacoustics interest that I told you about previously. During the 1960s, naval researchers began giving curious cytologists who had hitherto been forced to scavenge whaling ships to order, in order to access their study subjects, accidental submarine recordings, which is to say the hydrophone recordings that they took as submarine oper operators. One man, Frank Watlington, in 1967, handed off a tape to cytologist Roger Payne, which prompted Payne to bring a hydrophone to Bermuda later that year to record whales. As Payne and his colleague Scott McVeigh announced in the journal Science in 1971, and this is the first line of a scientific journal article, mind you, humpback whale sounds, humpback whales emit a series of surprisingly beautiful sounds. So this is, you know, someone talking to an objective or oriented audience about the beauty of the sound. The musicality of whale song form the basis of Payne and McVeigh's analysis. Their approach realized that there were notations of whale recordings that implicitly seemed to suggest a musical score. Henceforth, sounds that were once phonations, which is the more technical military term that had been used, could now be reclassified as songs. And these are a couple of the examples of how they would parse out the ordering of the songs and the units. So they'd have different units to represent the kinds of sounds they heard, and a whole mass mapping of these um, kinds of details that organizes their, um, their scientific journal article. In other words, they're attempting to find the, the musical score of what humpback whales are actually doing when they're making these songs. In using song, Payne and McVeigh claimed to be following W.G. Broughton, who had classified animal song as a series of notes, generally more than one type, uttered in succession and so related to form a recognizable sequence in pattern and time. Broughton made that statement in 1963. But I would argue that the declaration that they made 
actually could much more closely echo the contemporaneous efforts of people like Spong and Eric Hoyt in the north end of Vancouver Island. This is because lots of people were all of a sudden becoming interested in the musicality of whale song. Released between the first moon landing and the first Earth Day, Songs of the Humpback Whale provoked strong media responses. Time magazine balked at, quote, music that might have come from the throat of a 40-ton canary. <laughs> Rolling Stone celebrated a, quote, trippy record that stretches your mind to encompass alien art forms, prompting a Newsweek author to worry about kids lacing their whale songs with pot. <laughs> <laughs> the list of whale-inspired musical pieces is actually vast. The ones that follow the songs of the humpback whale I'm speaking about specifically. And they run from the gamut, um, from smooth jazz to space rock to everything in between. One scholar, D. Graham Burnett, estimates that over 150 items of popular music, Western music, have featured or thematized whale phonation since 1970. Mm -hmm. These include George Crumb's Box Belen, which imitated humpback whale songs on piano, flute, and cello, Paul Horn's Paul Horn and Haida, a flute duet with Haida, a killer whale, or Paul Winter's Common Ground, which sampled singing humpbacks over an ecologically oriented jazz album. But my personal favorite example, the one which really reveals how a whole new counterculture was picking up on whale sound too, is Pink Floyd's example. And this is um, from their 1972 album, Metal. This is um, a series, uh, this is a 23 minute song, which in the middle has this interesting kind of delay where um, the, the drums kind of fade away and the guitar enters in this kind of dramatic way. And I'll play that for you right now. And you can hear Roger Waters, I think, really imitating the song of the Humpback Whale album. Roger Payne spoke of, or Roger Waters, the lead singer of the band, spoke of Echoes as a song about the possibilities of communication. And it's, I think, notable that he used whale song, whale sound, to illustrate this idea of communication. My point is that this wouldn't have happened, this kind of combination of interests and sounds, and focus on the whale specifically, without a broader social context that is also coming to the interest of the whale song at this time. Given the social and scientific interest in whale communication, it made sense, in other words, to illustrate the idea of communication using whale song. As Pink Floyd suggests, whale song suggested new status markers, generational attitudes, environmental concerns, fitting new social needs. As such, whale song was not isolated from other trends. As Barstow reports, the early 1970s saw the greatest growth of interest in particular groups of wild animals ever experienced in human society. And in particular, whales were the main feature. Books and movies about whales, with subject depictions standing in marked contrast to those sea, uh, sea wolf depictions of earlier years, were proliferating. Farley Mowat wrote A Whale for the Killing in 1972. The English translation of Jacques Cousteau's The Whale, Mighty Monarch of the Sea, appeared in 1972. Joan McIntyre's heavily New Age influenced Mind of the Waters came out in 1974. And then in films, we have Paul Spong's We Call Them Killers. We have The Day of the Dolphin. The precursor to all this, of course, was Flipper, the TV show in the early 1960s, which made dolphins popular for the first time. In BC, looking at whales, listening to them, and donating money to save them, <coughs> collectively began to outline a suite of new activities in which middle class citizens could newly partake. So there's this growing relationship between citizenship and an understanding or appreciation of whales. My research suggests that the growing regime of experiences available around whales this time were closely connected to the emergence of a post-industrial economy. By the late 1960s, the lower mainland's industrial base had begun to shift to facilitate trade and tourism alongside primary commodity production. And we see this when we begin to see the growth of leisure activities, of tourism, of whale watching, and so forth uh, in the BC lower mainland area specifically. Mm -hmm. As whale sound fed new scientific interest in song, it likewise had sparked changes in the community of whale listeners, bringing in musicians, bringing in all sorts of other New Age people. And this produced growing tensions between cytology and the burgeoning environmental movement, to which I will now turn in my third installment, which is The Voice is Emotion. And here's a couple of examples, by the way, of some of the albums that came out in the wake of Peter McVeigh's um, Songs of the Humpback Whale. 
Okay, here's Paul Spahn. He's one of the major uh, figures in my story. In Song of the Whale, a 1986 book, Rex Weiler, a former Greenpeace founder, recounts Paul Spong's time at the Vancouver Aquarium between 1969 and 1971. To wit, a promising young scientist, schooled in the behavioralism of his day, arrives to work with a captive whale. He has no training in whale science, but he's interested in brain science, and the suggestion that he can work with an intelligent creature is, is interest, intriguing to him. But the encounter does more than intrigue, it transforms him, leading to Spong's highly publicized confrontation with his employers at the Vancouver Aquarium, a declaration of Scana's freedom, and Paul Spong's eventual escape himself into the wild to communicate with whales at the top of Vancouver Island. At the same time that this legend outlines a central environmentalist fantasy, a kind of into the wild experience, Paul Spong's ongoing work at Orca Lab, the Hanson Island DC research station where Cetacea Lab co-founders Herman Muter and Jeannie Ray also received training, suggests the life-altering possibilities of encountering whales through listening. With Spong, we reach a moment that reveals the present significance of listening at Cetacea Lab and on the North Coast today. The growing politicization that marked Spong's career was to a considerable extent mediated by listening. The effects are evident in his changed social conduct toward whales. His emotionally driven science built on the imputation of whale emotion, the sound of emotion. Listening to Skana, Spong encountered the voice as what I'm calling the voice's emotion. Spong's turn from established scientific practice in favor of an emergent experimentalism was also shaped by his context. Vancouver in the 1960s was a hotbed for draft dodgers, hippies, and peace activists. By the time of Spong's arrival, Curiosity and Moby Doll had become a fully-fledged fascination with the species. As D. Graham Burnett suggests, a crucial idea here was the emerging valorization of cetacean intelligence. Did that have really big brains? By the early 1970s, all sorts of studies of intelligent animals were appearing across zoology. This is when you have Jane Goodall's work begin to appear. This is when you have Altman and Altman's work. So there's all sorts of conceptual grounds being laid for the study of an intelligent whale. Among the different forms of intelligence receivable through listening is emotional intelligence. For Spong, listening provided him a means for grasping the depth of the creature he was engaging with. If his visual acuity tests, his behavioralism, suggested the inadequacies of behavioralist science, as Weiler and Zelko suggest, listening provided materials for a new accounting of Skana's subjecthood. Skana is the killer whale pictured here. Her ref refusal to accept a standard behavioralist reward, fish, moved Spong to do something very unusual, to replace the experiment with music. He began playing her Ravi Shankar, Beethoven, and even his own flute. At a 1972 conference, Spong speculated on the possibilities of music. I see that I'm a bit cut off there, so I'll read it out to you. Music we know to be a communication medium that transcends cultural boundings, boundaries in our own species. It is perhaps most effectively used for the communication of emotional data. So you see this kind of interesting residue from the voices code here, emotional data. We feel it has significant potential in the realm of interspecies communication. So you see as well that voices music has a kind of residual effect here as well. There's this attempt to forge some sort of relationship. Skana's intelligent disinterest in pushing buttons for fish had provoked an emotive response in Spong. It had demanded a change in her approach. As he summarized in 1978, I dropped my, post my posture of remoteness, opened my mind, and personally engaged myself in Skana's learning. A personally engaged assessment of Skana led Spong to surmise that her response to music was actually less about joyful stimulus than it was about an otherwise miserable quality of life. Speaking with me about this realization in the fall, <coughs> just to 2012 here, Spong's gentle demeanor turned quite upset. This is what he told me. Spong, Skana was just so bored in that concrete box, all day with nothing to do. And these words would accord with others I have spoken to about the experiences of captive whales, such as Naomi Rose, and, and who is now an animal rights campaigner who was originally a cetologist, or Graham Ellis, who is one of the foremost authorities on whale killer whales on this coast, and began his career as a trainer at Sea Land Pacific in Victoria. Spong's postulate that, quote, this whale was more like a person, provided, powerful organizing, provided a powerful organizing rubric for the Free Skana campaign, a human emotionalism that sound had extended into cetaceans as well. By the time of Spong, other cetologists had begun investigating whale sound and the conditions of its production, i.e. wild or in captivity, in a new way, as a kin forming social relation and even an ontological necessity, which means something that's crucial to the actual being of the whale. Animal rights activists like Peter Singer and Tom Regan were by the late 70s pointing to whales as evidence of dangerous human exceptionalism, the idea that only emotions apply to the human. For whales, it wasn't only sound, it was the emotional need for sound. In Skana's concrete box, that is to say in her captive environment, the absence of sound now provo provoked evidence for a whale's injurious state. And coming out of this, we see more studies begin to look at the effects that whale sounds 
or the absence of whale sounds have in captive situations. So we have the, the stunted vocabulary of a captive killer whale named Haida, with a headbanging communicator displays of another captive whale named Miracle. Isolation led to sensory deprivation, which led to social death. These are the associative links that sociologists have begun to establish, which is now painfully evident if anyone here has seen the movie Blackfish and looked at the ways that Tilikum has behaved as a result of decades of captivity. By the early 1970s, the plight of whales had been felt across the BC coast <coughs> in connection to the dangers of a growing captivity industry, which is also related to the fascination that the whale stand had provoked. Between 1965 and 1973, 48 killer whales, 27% of the southern resident population, had been captured in waters near Vancouver Island and sold to Oceanaria around the world. Their value as commodities dramatically rose during this process. If in the 1960s you could buy a whale for $8,000, by the beginning of the 1970s, upwards of $300,000 would fetch you a whale. And if it was a male whale capable of breeding, even more. One of the reasons why Tilikum is so important for you know, captors of SeaWorld is because Tilikum has produced over 40 whales around the world, or Tilikum sperm, I should say. The passage of the Marine Mammal Protection Act in 1972 in the US made it difficult to take killer whales in American waters. So more and more buyers began to move north. The work of Michael Big and others at the Department of Fisheries and Oceans here in Canada uh, was crucial to establishing new insights and claims about the effects that that capture process had had. In collaboration with a network of coastal citizen volunteers, whom Big called Keeners, surveys began to be proliferated up and down the BC coast, asking people to write in if they saw a whale. Um, the eventual results of the survey compellingly suggested that what was once believed to be a healthy population in the thousands actually only revealed an at-risk figure somewhere in the low hundreds, which is to say killer whales were much less plentiful than we previously assumed. This was, of course, being noticed by people like Spong in other parts of Vancouver. It was Spong, in fact, who managed to convince Greenpeace, then a fledgling Vancouver anti nuclear group, to develop an institutional interest in protecting whales. Notions of whale scarcity, suggestive of the planetary scarcity increasingly being documented by the early 1970s. You have the limits to growth, you have Paul Ehrlich's The Population Bomb, could add force to environmental campaigns worldwide. Greenpeace held the world's first anti-whaling protest at the United Nations Conference on the Human Environment in Stockholm in 1972, and has of course consistently disrupted whaling activities from the Japanese and the Russians ever since. But the emotional associations that whale sounds brought worked in other ways too. Along with other whale center NGOs, like Project Jonah or, she, or Sea Shepherds, so that's Paul Watson's famous group, um, Greenpeace has used whales to facilitate extensive public relations activities with successful funding drives built on the charisma and compassion of whales and activists. These strategies are evident in the first whaling shows that they helped Paul Spong organize at the Vancouver Theater, the Queen Elizabeth Theater. These were popular social events that in the early 1970s featured protocol um, photos of misty morning kayaks with whales a mode of whale song playing in the background. Greenpeace also developed sophisticated media tactics around the use of whale sound. In 1975, when six killer whales were captured from Victoria Sealand, Greenpeace members approached the captive's pen, recorded the whale calls and screams, and sent the tapes to, the lower main, to uh, radio stations throughout the Lower Mainland. These kinds of activities presupposed that knowing and caring about whales had become significant to a broad segment of the population in BC. They presupposed, in other words, new emotional depths possibly even deeper than a Pink Floyd guitar solo. A provincial ban on killer whale capture was instigated in 1975, 10 years after the cessation of whaling, thanks to a combination of public pressures by the groups like Greenpeace, as well as the scientific reportage by people like Michael Bay. So you, you see the science and the environmentalism begin to kind of intertwine more. As the Greenpeace radio example suggests, environmentalism had um, itself learned to exploit whale sound for tools of social persuasion. The emotionalism of the sound belied a certain kind of recruitment function. It's encouragement that people move to committed social action. As these accounts suggest, whales were clearly not being conceived as sound-guided missiles with advanced cognitive function anymore. In whale sound, uh, which had previously been about rendering exterior underwater topography, remember, and echolocation and submarines and all that, it was now claimed that new insights could be revealed into the interiorities of consciousness and crucially interspecies communication. There were new layerings of emotive attributes. Whale sound conjured richly, notion, quali no, no, richly qualitative notions of play, intelligence, and emotion. The histrionics that whales occasionally inspired bordered on the absurd, such as John Joe McIntyre's claim that she loved to make love to a sperm whale. In the ability to implicate whale sound within an increasingly spectacle-driven society, and this is again the post-industrial society that I was speaking of earlier, <coughs> the mode of environmentalists helped to make whales newly profitable to a growing leisure class. 
The late 1970s saw a proliferation of relaxation in easy listening whale albums. Dolphin therapies <coughs> popped up in California, Australia, and Hawaii. One example would be Dolphinville, which was founded in 1977, an intentional community that still runs today and bases itself largely on the promise of interspecies communication, and in fact, also some harm to the whales themselves and the dolphins. So there's a lot of cross currents happening by the late 1970s in terms of the popularity of whales, the effects that are actually being felt in the populations, and then these kinds of offshoot communities which are really committed to um, the possibility of whale communication or dolphin communication, but also a whole way of life organized around that. By the late 1970s, Paul Spong had become peripheral to the mainstream cytology represented by the Vancouver Aquarium, and was busy at Orca Lab developing a wild research practice built on a network of shore-based hydrophones. The social tumult of the early 1970s had left a mark in the mainstream scientific establishment as well. As social interpretations of whale sound extended into theorizations of the animals and claims such as dolphin bills, the field's authority had been tested, and I think shaken as well. John Ford's dissertation in 1984 on killer whale acoustics, to which I now turn, represented a pushback. As I suggest here, his catalog of communicative whale sounds, which would anticipate a whole host of disciplinary efforts similar to this, was not so much a refutation of whale sounds' social and ideological power as it was a recognition of its social pervasiveness and danger to scientific practice. Here's John Ford with Michael Bay and Graham Ellis. When I met John Ford at his DFO office, which is um, located in Nanaimo, to discuss the social circumstances around his dissertation, he began with an anecdote. Mike Big used to ask facetiously after he came back from a month in Robson Light or some other place, how did it all go? And did you find the whales? Yeah, just about every day. And then he'd say, well, did you see him do anything smart? <laughs> By the mid-1970s, popular ideas of intelligent and smart whales had generated considerable disciplinary anxiety. They made cytologists like Ford nervous. The Greenpeace, Greenpeace histrionics, exemplified by one Victoria Times columnist interviewee who claimed that scientists were becoming convinced that whales are more capable of communicating with human beings, which was not the case, had not helped matters. As Ford said, I was viewed with some uncertainty within his field about whether I was just an orcateer, someone who wants to study <laughs> dolphins and whales because they're really smart. <laughs> These sentiments were echoed by other anno anointed orcateers I spoke with. Andrew Trites, Linda Nichol, Naomi Rose, and David Bain, for example. What Orcateers represented was an affront to the idea of objectivity. Objectivity being, of course, the paramount epistemic virtue of modern science. As historians of science, Lorraine Dassin and Peter Gallison show, the status of objectivity is premised on changing appraisals of subjectivity and historically fluid ideas of how evidence-based practice can be contaminated by sociocultural influence. In other words, objectivity is about managing subjectivity including the sorts of personal responses that whale sound was generating in the New Agers, like books at Dolphinville. Relying on a battery of statistics, dendrograms, spectrograms, and hundreds of hours of close scientific listening, Ford pursued objectivism as a practice of the neutral and emotionless scientist. Discrete whale calls, reason to be constituent to pod-specific repertoires, did not promise a yearn for Rosetta Stone. They gave information. Quantitative whale sound now offered a basis on degrees of difference or similitude for interpod relations and thus history and lineage too. This was an objectivism that sought to literally have the evidence speak for itself. This is a, one of the tools that John Ford used. This is a case sonogram, which is capable of producing statistical and visual outlays of the sounds he recorded. So you'd feed a tape in there, and then you can see at the top there the kind of stylus right over there is producing these spectrographic outlays, which I'll show you in more detail in a second. So a lot of his dissertation was spent in the basement working with a machine like this interpreting whale sound in a newly objective way. It is telling that two of the best known studies of whale sound, John Lilly's 1961 and Payne and McVeigh's, which I referred to in 1971, are actually absent from Ford's dissertation. At the same time, and in a rare burst of speculative association for an otherwise very numerically focused dissertation, Ford references primatology, which is noteworthy for two reasons. Primatology, or the study of apes, has a long and accomplished history and provided justification for the scientific study of whale sound because primate research was also interested in animal sound, in other words. Primate research suggesting that calls given during heightened social excitement tend to be shorter and higher in pitch could support similar claims regarding whale pitch. So you could still study whale emotion, but now you can look at it as a matter of frequency raising or speed. And there's another reason primatology was also interesting to Ford, or at least I'm speculating, and that's because of it being a field that had been assailed by competing social interests. 
Much like the study of whales, the study of apes and monkeys has involved all sorts of other kinds of claims, non-scientific claims, to knowing the species. So this is a field which has learned how to manage the claims around the uh, study species. This is the voice of objectivity, my fourth point of reference. And it's all about restoring a sense of reliability to the interpretation of whale sound. Ford's work with it was about a common language to discuss the chirps and clicks. And as, such, it and as such, it participates in what some scholars have called the view from nowhere. This is a term that scientists or scholars of science use to look at the way that scientists construct evidence. Nowhere as an impartial, as in not accountable to this or that context. For, for, for cytology, we might call this the heard from nowhere. And indeed, for Ford, sitting in his basement office in UBC in the early 1980s at 2 a.m. with headphones on, nowhere is a pretty good description. <laughs> so now I'm going to give you an <coughs> example of the kind of work that has evolved out of Ford's um, very pioneering uh, insights. And he really has been one of the most important whale scientists on the BC coast since the early 1980s. This is um, G. Clan Orca, which is northern resident, which means it's up near here. And what you see here is a visual representation of the call. So this is a spectrogram, or an outline of the sounds that are being produced. Well, the reason we know it's a subclan is because of the work of Ford, who spent years and years, really, li listening to calls like this and grouping the uh, associations according to lineages and pods based on the sounds themselves. By the mid-1980s, Ford's acoustics, supplemented with the work of Michael Big, the Keeners and that sort of thing, um, had assigned every killer whale in the northern and southern, southern resident populations with an identity, as well as an acoustic grouping. And I have a photo of that, or of um, the kind of thing you see now, here. This is a uh, photo from the DFO catalog. So you can't actually see them in the image here, but you can sort of see the ones in the bottom right-hand corner each of those dorsal fins has a tag and identification next to it. The, the scientists can literally identify the different whales based on the unique marks, the saddle patch, which is the weight area, or the shape of the dorsal fin as well. And they've identified hundreds of killer whales this way uh, through a visual combination, or a combination of visual and acoustic association. Now these developments also suited the growing whale watching industry that was growing out of Victoria, Tofino, and the Johnson Strait beginning in the 1980s. Tourist hotspots where, where visitors could now, thanks to work like this, expect scientific accounts of calls and pod structures. There's also growing at this time the BC Cetacean Sightings Network, which actually began formally in the late 1990s, but which uh, at this point was still being uh, passed around through the work of people like Michael Big. More and more people on the coast were becoming aware and knowledgeable of whales and were able to contribute their knowledge to these scientists. So fishermen, people who had places next to the sea and so forth. They were also interested in these kinds of cataloging efforts and became wrapped into the larger project of producing the science. Ford's insights, in other words, gave real reason for independent whale research endeavors in BC, including Cetacea Lab, and they gave them an invaluable research tool. They created, or his work, I mean, created a common language for describing killer whale calls and acoustic behavior. And by the mid-1990s, there was indeed a growing regime of independent research stations, often organized as charitable trusts and um, volunteer groups along the BC coast. Through these groups, detecting a group of our clan killer whales on a hydrophone could feed into research initiatives down in the city. So you had networks connecting research up in the north coast or central coast to you know, the Vancouver Aquarium or UBC or other offices of DFO. The first expression of this citizen cytology movement was, of course, Spawn's Orca Lab, which was founded in 1970 and is now remaining the, wor the world's longest continuously running whale research station, well, independent whale research station, I should say. But today in BC, we also have Salmon Coast, which is run by Alexander Morton. Strawberry Island Research Society, Pacific Wild, which is uh, Ian McAllister, MERS, and of course Cetacea Lab. In these places, and this is the final point to which I'll turn, another component of whale sound and the associations to it was consolidated. One which traces in the expression of sound a networking of spatial and species codependence. To understand this fifth constitutive element of whale sound, what I'm calling the voice of environment, we now turn to Orca Lab. So here's Orca Lab at the top of Vancouver Island. Well, it's actually Hanson Island, so it's about 10 minutes by boat um, away from the actual mainland island. By 1969, Spong was speculating that killer whales can, quote, obtain a three-dimensional view of their environment just by listening. But studying the relationship between whale sound and the environment had not been possible, or at least desirable, in Scana's concrete box. But at Orca Lab, Spong's wild research station, which he now runs with Helen Simmons, he and his colleagues could develop a practice that put the surroundings back into the analysis of the sound. 
Last fall, I met with Spawn on Hudson Island to discuss his changing perspectives. He offered this account to me. I'll read it out as well. I was convinced in a captive setting, music held a certain fascination to them. And I still, to a certain extent, think that's true. We did experiments out in the wild to see if we could attract their interest and interact with them using music as a medium. Up here, the overwhelming impression was that their own lives are just so much more interesting to them. We're just so peripheral. <laughs> So this is actually really important, I think. This idea of peripherality uh, is crucial to what listening to the wh to whales in the environment is really all about. <coughs> Which isn't to say that humans aren't impactful, but that the lives of whales involve things that we are completely peripheral to and probably inaccessible to us as well. Crucially enabling this at Work Lab was a material innovation. Building on ideas of hydrophone arrays, first explored by William Sheeble way back in 1966, Work Lab had by the mid-1980s established a network of hydrophones in the underwater trenches around Work Lab. If you recall that photo I showed you at the beginning of Cetacea Lab's network, that's, th that's very much premised on what Orca Lab did, which was to say, rather than just drop a hydrophone in the water, they drilled them to the bottom of the ocean floor in spatially specific areas. So now you could have a whole underwater grid of hydrophones listening, and whales passing through would correspond to the different hydrophones in the different areas. You know if they're going east or west, you know how long they're staying in certain areas, and you may even know how many of them there are as well. This spatialized listening system allowed for the crude localization of calling whales and the ability to track their movements through an area, making possible new understandings of habitat use. In other words, it made the entire environment part of the story, the humans only part of that story. Using Forrest's catalog of pod-specific calls and a rotating cast of volunteers, which were formalized into internships in the early 1990s, Oracle Lab has developed an extensive long-term inventory of killer whale travel patterns and seasonal occurrence in the Johnson Strait area as well as tens of thousands of hours of killer whale recordings, forming a rich research archive for cetologists interested in killer whale use of the area and their changing acoustic behaviors. For over 20 years, Helena Simmons, a former school teacher, has co-run Orca Lab with Spawn, and has now become one of the most well-respected PAM authorities on the entire BC coast. And when I say well-respected authorities, I don't just mean people know that she knows her science. I mean that if they want to know who has the best ear for killer whale calls, they'll often turn to Helena, who can pick out not only if that's a G-clan or an A-clan, but also what pod it's belonging to, if it's a mother, if it's a child, all sorts of incredible details that just completely pass by me. As we sat in Oracle Lab's dining room on a sunny August afternoon, Helena reflected on her listening practice. <coughs> One of the most satisfying experiences is to be in the lab, and you are there, and you are trying to understand what's going on, and there are all these groups out there, and it goes on for hours, and then it's over and you realize that you've been there for this whole several hours of life, movement and activity. And it's satisfying, but really satisfying. And this, I think, gets to the ethical moment I wanted to bring up as well. PAM, or listening's ability to produce ethically enriching experiences, emerges when the crackle and the hiss of the hydrophone suddenly clarifies into a listening width, which is, which is to say when Paul and Helena, or people like them, begin to sound out underwater space with another life. Their ability to comprehend what's going on involves a negotiation between signal and context, between data acquisition, but also sensuous engagement trying to imagine, even if you can't completely ever imagine, what it's like to be a whale in that area, listening and communicating with other whales, and understanding the space in which the whale's moving. This is a commitment to pursuing cetology, but it's also, as Simmons would repeatedly emphasize to me, a commitment to that space, meeting the environment of the Johnson Strait. There's a productive tension here between signal and context, an interplay of concern for the whale and concern for the world around the whale. And this would have real political benefits as well. Orca Lab's acoustical data would be instrumental to efforts to designate the area, the Johnson Strait, as critical habitat for northern resident killer whales in 2007. It's also proved important for other whale scientists to come up to the area and continue their studies, and for region regional people to know about the importance of protecting whales. At the same time, though, it's also contributed to the region's growing social renown, in turn facilitating the rapid rise of the Johnson Strait uh, whale watching industry. Whale watching practices Fit with, fit with the local contraction of the forestry sector and the global expansion of tourism that has rechanged and shaped the Johnson Strait area, the whole northern coast of uh, Vancouver Island. So now we have this huge whale watch industry in the Vancouver Island area. A recent DFO estimate suggests that upwards of 300,000 commercial vessels now annually run the BC coast, the majority of them in the Johnson Strait, Victoria's Harrow Strait being a big major one as well. And by the early 1990s, Many cetologists were suggesting that BC's whales were suffering the nefarious effects of this attention. Among the concerns, and with particular relevance uh, on my focus today with listening, is ocean noise. Anthropogenic sound with the potential to have injurious effects on whales. All sorts of effects, communication masking, habitat avoidance, 
and an array of physiological damages, which have resulted in ruptured eardrums, which for, for forced uh, breachings, and in some cases, actual death. Um, so ocean noise would become, a, I think, a rich expression of the non-innocence of listening and the consequences of unchecked human desires to get too close to the whales. So the whale watching industries, motors, do not make things easy. One study, in fact, would report that 560 incidences in one year in the Harrow Strait um, have provenly violated the voluntary code of conduct for whale watching, meaning that humming motors were brought far too close to the whales and were um, deemed safe by the scientists. Spong, Paul Spong and his research partner, Helen Simmons, were among the first whale residents of the Johnson Strait area. By the mid-1980s, the region's population had begun to grow, and the Johnson Strait had become an increasingly popular destination. Thanks to their repeated listening exposure to these boat engines, Spong and Simmons were among the first ecologists to recognize the dangers of ocean noise. Its painful listening experience, blanking out a killer whale call with a ranking low-level drone, became part of their attempts to grasp killer whale's spatial acoustic behaviors, as well as their ethical and emotional lives, and it provoked in them an ethical realization. By the mid-1980s, by the late 1980s rather, Orca Lab had ceased all boat-based research, becoming completely dependent on hydrophones and shore-based visual observation. In this context, then, the voice of environment names the realization that listening may be one of the only ecologically safe ways to study animals that are increasingly under threat from human disturbance, not only in BC, but all around the world. So now we turn to the conclusion. It's amazing just how far appraisals of whales in BC have come since the time of Sheevel and Watkins. At the beginning of the 1960s, salmon fishers had a shoot on site policy with killer whales because they were fearful of their taking the fish away. When Murray Newman, director of the Vancouver Aquarium, commissioned a killer whale capture that eventually became Moby Doll, it wasn't for a live specimen, it was for an actual sculpture that a botched harpooning made it in, in, you know, imperative to bring the whale in, and then they ended up having to keep the whale for 90 days. By the inception of Oracle Lab, BC cytologists had moved away from research practices that were invasive, such as dissection, and began to embrace less aggressive measures like open sea behavior studies and passive acoustic wandering. The story for cytology doesn't end here, of course, and in BC, the field continues to make advances across a range of subfields, fields including genetics, social history, and cetacean hearing, and an important ethical debates remain around those uses as well. But with respect to cetacean lab, I think this kind of gathers in the five constituent features of what has really defined that experience for me and also for people like Claire. My interest then has been to use cetacean lab to read into one particular history of cetology with these five components, code, music, emotion, objectivism, and environment, as a range of associations that come with the engagements with whale salmon. They also outline the various social histories which came to life in the everyday practices of being a cytologist there, the continued use of the military hydrophones, the enjoyment of singing humpbacks, the emotional associations with those sounds, the scientific focus, and then lastly, the environmental concern. The value that Spong and Simmons drew from their listening practices revealed itself in material practices. Oracle Lab's commitment to knowing which pods share their hands on island surroundings, self-appointed efforts to coach regional boaters on proper whale proximities, and ongoing attempts to ensure the release of Corky, a northern resident of the whale that's still performing as Shamu in SeaWorld. On the North Coast today, Herman and Jane pursue a similar politics and have emerged as powerful advocates for the protection of whales in the face of Enbridge's northern gateway. Emerging collaborations with Woods Hole, Gitgat First Nation, and the WWF, which are targeted at expanding Cetacea Lab's hydrophone network, suggest that it will remain an important local site for the politicized study of whales. Here's a few shots of what it was like to be there. But as BC converts its coastline into an import-export zone, it becomes progressively more difficult to sustain this kind of politicized and eminently ethical whale research. The current prospects for whales on the North Coast are in fact dismal. Canadian, Canada's key environmental protections, which include the Species at Risk Act, or SARA, and the attendant recovery strategies for the different species, are ill-equipped to deal with the multiplying risk that tankers pose, a condition exacerbated, exacerbated by the incapacitation of key environmental regulatory agencies, such as the DFO, such as Environment Canada, and so on. To allay public concern, Enbridge burnishes very sophisticated techno fixes with whale detection and response mechanisms gathering around advanced iterations of PAM. So PAM is important for the industrial study of whales as well. But unsurprisingly, the cytology community is dubious of these efforts, such as the idea that they could result in tankers turning their course if a whale pod gets too close. <laughs> and some studies suggest that shipping would actually increase tenfold in the North Coast should Enbridge proceed. Meanwhile, Enbridge is not the only thing that would be proceeding. The additional risks represented by the likely approval of liquefied natural gas, with several hundredfold increases in tanker traffic bringing no shortage of ocean noise, not to mention ship strike or spill risks, have not even been accounted for. Tanker prospects are especially alarming in light of the increasing compact numbers 
and historic returns of fin whales and right whales recently documented by Cetacea Lab and others. Critical habitat for both humpback whales and proposed critical habitat for northern resident killer whales in the north coast both spatially correspond to the Kitimat bound shipping routes. Okay, I'll leave you with a quote by a Slovenian philosopher named Mladen Dolar, who writes about the voice as a sort of promise, something that we constantly yearn for. My interest hasn't been to discredit the powerfully personal emotional experiences that listeners of whales can have, but rather to contextualize them, to show that they have a history, and to propose that important political relationships exist in this space as well. To Dolar's notion that the voice is the kernel of human subjectivity, 40 years of cytology in BC have appended a question mark. Perhaps for whales as well, the voice is the kernel of subjectivity. If the meaning of whale sound remains inaccessible to cytology, however, on the north coast, this science raises the prospect of a terrifying likeness. Stressed and sensorially damaged creatures subsisting in environments of increasingly hostile interference. As the North Coast gets noisy with the sounds of economic globalization, it is imperative that we continue listening to whales. But more importantly, and with the utmost ethical concern and respect for proximity, we have to act for them as well. sure uh, he would entertain questions. Yes. Yeah. Uh, a friend of mine did her doctoral research on uh, the accumulation of mercury in um, belugas in the Arctic. And I'm wondering, is anybody looking at um, changes in um, the voicings of whales over time to see if there's any sort of um, any change resulting from damaging substances inside brains of whales? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, uh, one of the things you're speaking about, and one of the things that scientists have conveyed to me, is that perhaps the most dangerous thing that's happening with whales right now on the North Coast is the, metabol the, the metabolization of toxic blubber, which means that they store these kinds of uh, chemicals in their, in their skin, and then as they, as they convert it into food, and into fatty tissues, they absorb the, the chemicals as well, and they get right into the bloodstream and so forth. So, you know, the chemical outflows of, of you know, all sorts of activities into the coast have a major impact on whales. Um, I haven't seen correlations specifically with, with humpback sounds or killer whale sounds, but there have been documented cases of this, the nature of the song itself changing. So, you know, you have people like Roger Payne now speaking 40 years later of the fact that you can't hear humpback sing like you could in the 1970s. You don't hear the same quality, you don't hear the same amount of detail. And there are other cases of masking, which means that, you know, the killer whales can't communicate or they can't acquire their prey because of the presence of sound of noise, but also because of physiological changes in their bodies. So, you know, the inability to find the same kind of um, communicative display. So there are definitely connections, although I don't know the specific uh, overlap. Yeah? Yes, uh, well, I think in Vancouver Island, in Gulf River, uh, some 12 years ago, I was lucky enough to meet Luna, um, the killer whale, which uh, who reside uh, at Nootka Sound. And uh, I would drive there and just put my fingers and flap them, and Luna would come up. And uh, um, I was very moved every time. And I noticed that my dog behaved very weird. And to the point that one day, he, he was uh, still a puppy in his mind. And he would just sit there, watch Luna, and one day he gave him a big, you know, ha a kiss with his tongue, and Luna did not basically nothing. And then um, my the next door house was rented to writers, to a couple of writers who were writing a book about Luna, and they lent me some of their recordings from hydrophones. And one day I was playing one of the song and Rudy was with me in the car and he flipped and he was, you know, howling and he was like, for me, it sounded like he understood the, what whales were try, uh, singing. Yeah. Is it possible? That's a, you know, that's really funny because I was thinking one thing I wanted to pack into this already pretty packed talk. Um, <laughs> Cetacea Lab has two dogs, and Nikas is the older of the two. 
and Nikus could hear a breach, which is to say a whale blow, before the scientists, before the human ears could, and would immediately begin to bark. So uh, Nikus became a kind of early warning system for the scientists to get out there and look with the, mic with the binoculars and start listening closely on the hydrophones and so forth. And there was this incredible association that was that was you know existing there, and you know also came out whenever Nikus came on the boat with us and just got really excited and knew that it was because a whale was coming by. Uh, and in other cases, whales have been or dogs have been used to uh, sniff out for for whale poop uh, on, on more boats to locate it so that um, scientists can then retrieve it and do sorts of tests on it. So there was an interesting relationship between dogs and whales, and there's definitely I'm sure you know uh, cases of very close relationships developing with scientists who have dogs like Nikus. Um, so I, I don't actually know, you know, the, the specifics of what you're asking, but I think you're probably right to guess that there's an important connection that's being forged there. Well, you said that um, um, that um, orcas uh, prefer orcas, but how about Luna? He preferred people. He rejected his uh, part. Well, I mean, I think I think it's very complicated when it comes to the question of what animals actually prefer. I think, um, you know, again, like the science that we have available suggests that there are incredibly important social bonds with these animals, mm -hmm. that killer whales especially are very social. And this is, you know, again, coming out of John Ford's work where he looks at the way that lineage structure works, that pods are recognizing the other pods by the calls. Um, so I would, I guess I would disagree with that. I think, you know, there are probably very important connections that whales can form with humans, but I think, you know, it's dangerous for us to assume that we have a privileged relationship to these animals. And it's dangerous because even if we're correct, there's so many of us getting close to these whales that you know all sorts of ecological consequences are raised if we pursue these relationships too closely. Which is again why I think listening may be one of the forms that we can pursue that is ethically and ecologically safe and maybe allows us to have these kinds of connections as well. I was wondering if there's, uh, you know, we're sort of a dominant species on the planet and uh, we go everywhere you know, under sea and on the tops of mountains. And things like that, um, places where other species such as whales can't go, but we assume a fairly significant intelligence to these beings, and I'm wondering if there's any significant evidence that they take an interest in us in a, in a, in a similar way to how we take an interest in them. I mean, I have an anecdote which struck me as indicative of something like that, but we were on Haida Gwaii a couple of summers ago, three summers ago, I guess, and we saw a humpback breaching about 400 yards away, so we stopped the zodiac. And uh, it seemed to be a young one. Uh, it wasn't full size, I don't think. But it approached us. Um, and I guess they don't have binocular vision. And you, you know, you've got the surface boundary of the water or air where they meet. And it zigzagged towards our zodiac circled around behind us and then came up and actually rubbed against the side of the boat. I mean, I couldn't put my hand on it like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were all just utterly flabbergasted by the event. And then, almost as if it was teasing us, it threw water into the boat with its <laughs> flukes mm -hmm. and then left, you know. But it, but it was really looking at us, you know, the zigzag. It was like, I'm looking through this eye, and I'm looking through this eye. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and it struck me, well, you know, this is a being that is curious. And I'm wondering if there's other, uh, a lot of evidence that suggests that this occurs frequently. Well, I mean, I think you raise like a really, like this is a sort of similar uh, point, I think. There are, you know, I don't want to pretend that I, that I have had an experience similar to that, because I haven't. But I, I've certainly heard other stories of, of pretty profound encounters with animals that appear to be quite curious and probably are cu quite curious in certain ways. And I think, you know, the story of Paul Spong really captures that uh, interplay of, of you know, um, I guess identification and difference in the sense that you identify that there's something that you're both sharing but there's also, you know, something that you can't grasp in that connection that, that you don't know necessarily why the whale is following you. Um, the movie Blackfish does a really good job, I think, of showing, of giving you evidence of the kinds of relationships that can form with trainers and killer whales. Uh, incredibly intimate and playful and fun relationships, but also very violent ones. And, you know, there are complexities that have to do with probably the individuals as well. Not just, you know, a killer whale species, but also the proclivities of this or that killer whale. So maybe some whales are very playful and other whales aren't. And I think 
this speaks to the idea that you know there is an incredible intelligence here and a sophistication and an emotional intelligence which uh, can run a whole gamut of you know kinds of responses to a boat, for example. So um, I guess the short answer is yes. I think that there are other examples of the kind of encounter that you have, but I don't think that it necessarily uh, adds up to um, an understanding of what those emotions and what those kinds of exchanges represent. Why don't we end it there, folks? Uh, please join me in thanking Matt for his presentation. <laughs> and, uh, I think that was a, an excellent example of uh, bringing a very scholarly analysis to uh, some uh, aspects of popular culture, and uh, our, it seems to be our our uh, universal feeling uh, among species to uh, to reach out and touch each other. So, uh, thank you. <laughs> Max could be teaching for you if you see this.